when you are forced to plead guilty. Think it can't happen? It does happen all the time. All the time in courts. Talk to anybody who's been incarcerated for a long period of time and they'll tell you about being forced to plead guilty even when they're not. And I was thinking about this today because of Rafael uh, Ruiz. Rafael Ruiz who spent 25 years in prison. He was convicted in 1985 of a rape in East Harlem in New York. So, and he professed his innocence and he spent 25 years in prison and he's been fighting the courts afterwards. The Innocent Pro Innocence Project, you've probably heard of that, has been helping this guy go back to court to find misplaced evidence that really proved that he was innocent. DNA didn't match. DNA did not match. And DNA evidence has improved quite a bit over the last 30 years, but while he was incarcerated, they weren't interested in going back to examine anything. So now he's been exonerated. Congratulations, he got exonerated the other day. And they say, oh, he has justice and he has redemption for being exonerated of the crime. But does he? Redemption? Never. How can you redeem that? He can never fully be redeemed. How do you make up for stealing someone's life? For taking 25 years of this man's life, taking half his life away, you stole it from him. You can't give that back. You cannot return that time. There is no redemption and there is no true justice. Although technically there is justice because you have to remember, and I've talked about this in previous videos, there's a difference between legal and moral justice. Legal justice is only the execution of law. If law has been properly executed according to the way it's written, technically it's legal justice. But moral or ethical justice, it's not there. It's just not there. He can never have real justice because they can't give him back his 25 years or the last 10 years that he spent pining over this and fighting over this. They cannot return the life that they stole from this man or anyone else in these types of situations. Um, now, before I get further into this, is something I'm going to read from, from the news story to kind of drive the point that I'm talking about home here. Now, there's supposed to be a restitution program in the United States where you've been incarcerated for a long period of time. The state, and that's probably the reason why he's been fighting for exoneration, quite frankly, but the state is supposed to award you back $100,000 for every year that you've been incarcerated, if I remember how this goes correctly, which means the state of New York owes him uh, $2.5 million. Good luck, uh, Raphael, <laughs> because you're going to have to fight for that too. States that owe restitution for wrongful uh, long-term incarcerations always try to avoid paying that out. They always fight it. They always resist it. He's going to end up back in court only this time trying to get his money, which will be awarded. The, the courts can't deny that he's owed that, but the state still will not pay. They're still not going to pay this guy. And he'll have to go to court again to enforce the first court order. <laughs> and that's how it works. It happens all the time. In liberal states like New York, New York, New Jersey, uh, Washington State, California, they're the worst for this kind of stuff. They always try to squirm out of it. And, you know, uh, sidetracking a little bit here, it's almost cruel to even let someone out who's been incarcerated that time because their life and their mind has changed so much living in that environment. Can you imagine being incarcerated for 25, 35, 40 years and getting out and trying to find a job even? <laughs> it's a, well, I see that there's a 35-year gap in your resume. Can you explain that? Well, I was in jail, but I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I was exonerated. So, uh, Las Vegas. Someone sent me this mug to the post office box down below anonymously. I didn't. If there was a name on it, I didn't find it, or else I would have. I would have said this person's name. I've never been to Las Vegas. I have uh, never been to Las Vegas. But thank you for the mug. Now I'm gonna. I'm gonna read this here, and this is the news story part of the news story. And it says, a prosecutor's job is not just to seek convictions, but to seek justice, says Manhattan District Attorney uh, Cyrus R. Vance Jr. Bullshit. That, I call BS on that right off. I apologize for uh, the rude language, but a prosecutor's job 
is to seek convictions. They will make that very clear unless something like this happens. Then it's, oh, we're really looking for justice. But once again, we're talking about legal justice, not ethical or moral justice. All right. And it says, uh, today's attorneys... For my office, conviction integrity program moved to vacate the 1985 conviction of Rafael Ruiz and to dismiss the indictment against him on the grounds of newly discovered DNA evidence. They already had the evidence. They just misplaced it for 35 years. We're pleased to be joined today in the motion by the Innocence Project, and I'm grateful for their continued partnership. I'd also like to thank the prosecutors in our conviction integrity program the first on the East Coast, and now he wants to take credit, basically. The first on the East Coast who work every day to review claims of innocence. They they don't want to release anybody. And just as importantly, to improve uh, prosecutorial practices on the front end and prevent wrongful convictions from happening in the first place. You don't care about that. You just want you just want those numbers stamp stamp stamp. And this is something I brought up before too. If you remember in Massachusetts a couple of years back. They had discovered, it had been discovered, that the laboratory for the, um, I forget which city this was or which county this was, but the labs in Massachusetts, they were uh, doctoring DNA results. And something like 26 or 28,000 cases were tainted, and many of those people may be innocent. And Massachusetts admits this, has fired people, has taken people to, uh, to court, to uh, scapegoat them for being responsible, but still does not want to examine those cases because they don't want to sit there and have to admit that many of those 26 or 28,000 people might be innocent and release them and then have to deal with the restitutions. They would rather bury those people and keep them in jail than admit they made a mistake and and revisit those uh, crimes. They're not going to do it. They don't care about that. Anyway, continuing here, it says Ruiz was initially offered, and this is the key here, this is the key to the whole point that I'm, I'm talking about in the video, about, um, about when you're forced to plead guilty, right? It says Ruiz was initially offered a plea deal of one and a half to three years for this brutal crime. Then they it says they suggest that the prosecutors recognize the weakness of the evidence in the case. So the prosecutors already knew something was wrong and that they might have the wrong guy, but they were going to press on anyway, basically. And it says Ruiz rejected that plea and was ultimately sentenced to eight and a third to 25 years and ended up getting the full 25 year sentence. So they said, we have, we'll give you one and a half years if you just take the rap. If you just suck it up and admit that you're guilty so that we can be right. And he goes like, but you're not right. I didn't do anything. So they slapped him. The judge smacked him down with a full 25 years in prison. And he served the full 25 years, right? Still reading here. This highlights the deeply concerning problem of the trial penalty quotations, and there is such a thing, in which defendants receive much longer sentences for the same crime if they choose to go to trial rather than if they had pled guilty. As a result, innocent people are very, are very often coerced to plead guilty to avoid the possibility of a harsher sentence at a trial. Um, and it goes on to say, of course, that Ruiz, who always maintained his innocence, chose to fight these charges and rejected the plea offer. But once convicted, he faced a far lengthier sentence, and that is the point. So basically, they think they have a weak case. We don't really have any uh, any evidence, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, too. If you've ever uh, been to a real jury trial, not on TV or in a movie, but a real one, or served on jury duty like I have, there's a huge difference. People there don't give a damn about anything. But if you have the nerve to refuse us for having weak evidence or no evidence at all, we'll really bury you. So a lot of times people will take a plea deal just to get away from the possibility of this ridiculous long jail sentence. Now... <laughs> Like I was saying, you know, if if you've ever been 
to a real jury trial or served on jury duty, you can be sure of three things. The judge doesn't give a damn. The prosecuting attorney or the district attorney does not give a damn about you. And the jury doesn't either. The jury just wants to go home. So there's some of the people that I served on jury duty with, they, didn't, they, they were so indifferent and so pissed off that they were even there. All they cared about was getting the hell out and going home. They didn't care if the person was guilty or innocent. Um, and mostly, mostly swayed by emotional testimony. No logic whatsoever. Where's Mr. Spock when you need him? And they'll bury people or give people ridiculous long sentences for things that don't matter. And then things that do matter, um, sometimes they get stupid sentencing on. And I'm thinking back, you know, this guy got 25 years on a rape charge. But there's uh, another case, and I can't remember the details of it, but it was like, I think it was California in the, in the 80s also. It was two, two kids, 15 years old, around about 15 years old or so. And they were setting fires, and they set fire to an apartment building, and this eight-year-old girl and her older brother and mother were killed. Now, the girl died on the scene, and the older brother and the mother died in the hospital like two weeks later from burn exposure. Basically, they, they suffered badly and died. And these two kids got caught and convicted and sentenced to basically three years in juvenile detention. Juvenile detention until they were 18 and then parole. So for arson and three counts of, I guess you could call it involuntary manslaughter, they got uh, three years in juvie. This guy got 25 years. I don't know the ins and outs of that particular case, but that sounds way off to me. But people are wrongfully imprisoned all the time. And as I was also saying, you know, once you've been incarcerated for a long period of time, it's almost pointless to let somebody go because they've become so adjusted to that particular life, they don't know what to do. And I'm thinking, the reason I, I say this is because I knew a guy who had been incarcerated, I want to say about 22 to 24 years, he told me. And this is when I was uh, still living in, in Kansas when I was the manager of the Family Dollar. There's a guy that came in on certain days of the week at the exact same time every time. And I had just made it, the reason I got into the conversation with him was because I had mentioned I could set my watch by him on certain days of the week. And he was like, I can't break the routines. And that's when he told me he, he had been incarcerated uh, for on a murder charge. And he said he did do it. It was a, But, you know, he was in a fight and killed the guy. He wasn't trying to kill him, but that's what ended up happening. And he got the full term for it. They, they buried him, too, for, for not pleading, quite frankly. But he can't break the routines. He says, I'm terrified. I'm terrified out here. I go... Uh, I, I got a job that the probation officer set up for me, so I get up, I go to work, and I go straight home, and I sit there. Or, you know, I and he comes to, the the reason he was coming to the Family Dollar was to buy food, buy little grocery items, you know, cans of tuna, whatever, because it was like across the street. And he didn't want to go any further than that from his home because he was scared. And he'd been freed for three or four years. And could not break this routine. He's afraid all the time, afraid of getting in trouble, um, forcing himself to stick to a pattern. So how is this guy free? He's still trapped in his mind. It's a, it's a damn shame. But yeah, absolutely, um, you can. And like I said, that's called the trial penalty. Can be incarcerated for ridiculous long periods of time for having the audacity to insist upon your innocence. And you can get convicted with little or no evidence whatsoever. Juries, judges, uh, prosecuting attorneys very often have this mindset that if you weren't guilty of at least something, you wouldn't be there anyway. This guy had to do something or he wouldn't be sitting here. Or I'm sure he committed some other crime. That's another good one. I'm sure he committed a crime somewhere. He's guilty of something, so this will make up for it. Like that's your decision to make. Hell, even your own attorney doesn't care. And if you have a court-appointed attorney, you're as good as dead. You may as well kill yourself. Because those guys really don't care. Court-appointed attorneys are useless. I know I talked a lot, but 
Let me know what your thoughts are. Tell me about it in the comment section down below. What do you think about all of that? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Because there is no true justice in any court system, any legal system anywhere. Because it can't, they, the way that it's set up, there's no moral or uh, ethical connection to it. It's all legal justice. But share your thoughts. Please do give the video a thumbs up if you get where I'm coming from. Share it if you can. Subscribe if you're new. Check out some of the other videos if you haven't. Hit the bell icon and if you wanted to... There's a truck outside. Can you hear it? It's loud. If you wanted to uh, help the channel out, there are links for that down below, including a post office box where sometimes people send me something like this mug. So what else can I say but stay tuned, folks, because there is more to come.